handmade vulva puppet. So imagine this is a penis. Wait, there's a sexual assault scene in Bridgerton? <laughs> Pleasure Trove is back, baby. And we are gonna be talking about lots of stuff to do with sex, relationships, and gender in the news, in pop culture, and just some um, sexy faves, maybe some product recommendations if you're lucky. So starting off with some stuff in the news. Back in December, there was a case at the High Court of Justice in England and Wales called Bell versus Tavistock that related to puberty blockers for under 18s. And the ruling basically is not looking good for trans youth with gender dysphoria who want to go on hormone blockers to stop or slow or halt their puberty process. The case was about Gillick competence, which is a term used in medical law, and I'm just gonna read what the definition of it is from the NHS website. Children under the age of 16 can consent to their own treatment if they're believed to have enough intelligence, competence, and understanding to fully appreciate what's involved in their treatment. And basically what this case ruled was that young people are not Gillick competent to consent to their own hormone blocking treatment. This is the kind of summary that I got from the organization Gendered Intelligence. If you're under 13, you could theoretically get puberty blockers, but it's practically impossible with the current system in place. 14 to 15 year olds, it will be very difficult and you'd need court permission. And 16 to 17 year olds is a bit easy and you might need court permission. Now, this sucks a lot of trans organizations and trans charities have been speaking out about this and how it really harms trans youth. But there is some good news, an appeal has been granted and the organizations Brooke, Gendered Intelligence and the Endocrine Society are going to be putting forward the views of young trans people. So this is something that is really important to keep an eye on and I just really, really hope that it goes the way that we want so that young people, young trans people can make decisions for themselves about their bodies and get that vital, vital treatment that they need. Whilst we're on the topic of trans rights, the publication Galdem recently did an investigation into transphobia in the gender violence sector. And I'll link the article in the description and I would highly recommend reading it. Trans women are extremely vulnerable to domestic violence and sexual violence. And the system is just completely letting them down when it comes to accessing support. I just wanna read a quote from the article from Cara English from Gendered Intelligence. The fact we're still in a position where we're actively having to humanize trans women and trans people to services that would seek to exclude us in order to get into places that we should have the right to access this is just an obscene position to be in. And I think that just hits the nail on the head because trans people shouldn't be put in that position. At the moment in the UK, the discourse around trans people is being framed as a debate. This is not up for debate. I said this on Twitter, but I'll say it again here. Whenever I do speak about trans rights, there are always some people in my comments, in my mentions saying, how could you? As a woman, as somebody who fights for women's rights, how could you support trans rights? And here's what I have to say about that. Trans liberation is an integral part of smashing the patriarchy. It's not an obstacle, it's not an afterthought, it is crucial. Moving on to something a bit more lighthearted, and that is the whole fiasco that happened online recently about Zoella, the exam board AQA, sex toys, masturbation. What was that? So basically AQA, who are an exam board in the UK, removed Zoella from their media studies curriculum, I think for GCSE. And their reasoning was because the content wasn't appropriate for teenagers as the Zoella website had recently done an article about sex toys. Zoe Sugg, who's the founder of the Zoella brand, spoke out about this just saying that the content that she makes is for women in their 20s and 30s and so like obviously they're gonna cover things relevant to that demographic. A lot of people were getting involved and in showing their support for Zoe on social media and then it just kind of turned into this whole conversation around female pleasure and female masturbation and how that shouldn't be something that we hide from teenagers. And my take is that what I think happened with AQA is just a classic case of erotophobia where sexuality is something to be feared and it's seen as damaging and corrupting. Now I do understand that media studies 
studies isn't necessarily the best place for sex ed or discussions around masturbation or self-pleasure, but those conversations can absolutely be had in an appropriate way for GCSE age students, which is 14 to 16. However, media studies could absolutely be a brilliant place to talk about media messages around sex and sexuality. Think sexualized advertising and then TV shows like Bridgerton or Normal People. Like how cool would that module be? I wanna take that module. <laughs> okay, so moving on to books because I love sharing some sexuality books with you and I wanna share, can we talk about consent? A book about freedom? Choices and Agreement by Justin Hancock. Only a small part of this book is actually about sexual consent. It kind of looks at consent as a whole with ourselves, with other people in society, all different kinds of consent and it is wonderful. I had a lot of aha moments reading this book and I wanna share with you some of my key takeaways. The first one is that we shouldn't be in a position where we have to say no. And this is just game changing for me. The idea is that if you are asking somebody to do something with you, to do something for you or whatever, give options and also give them an out. So much of the conversations that I think we have about consent put the responsibility on the person who has to give consent or not give consent, but half of the responsibility is on the person asking. And you need to ask in a way that you're not actually putting someone in a position where they have to tell you no. Because the way that we are socialized is that it's really difficult to say no. Another idea that I want to share from this book is that the key to good relationships isn't what you do together, but the process of working out what you want to do together. So what does that mean? It's not about if you had oral sex or if you had anal sex or if you went to the movies or if you got a pizza, it's, it's not about the act. It's not about the thing. It's about the process of how you got to whatever conclusion you got to. What was the conversation like when you were deciding which movie to watch? What was that conversation like? Or how did you navigate figuring out what sex acts you wanted to do together or not want to do together. Relationships shouldn't be deemed good just because you do lots of things together. What was the process behind them? Like, why are you doing those things together? Was everyone's preferences considered before you did those things? It's the journey, not the destination that counts. And that applies to so many things in life. But I really love this framing of thinking about a healthy relationship, a good relationship, being about that process, not the end result. Another way of thinking about that would be that mine and Dan's relationship isn't good because we're married. That's irrelevant. Our relationship is good because of how we came to the conclusion that we wanted to get married together. That process of that conversation that we had, the discussions, the planning, like that whole process, that is what makes our relationship good, not the fact that we're married. Does that make sense? Next up, I have an Instagram favorite for you. It is Dr. Natasha Ramsey, who goes by Gorgeous Doc on Instagram. I saw her speak at the latest online slam event, Sexuality Liberators and Movers. She's a doctor and a lot of her content on Instagram focuses around sex and our bodies. She's also an illustrator. And one of the things that she spoke about on her talk was that when she was looking for images to use about anatomy and about puberty, she'd go online and search for images and diagrams, it was all white bodies. So she has created some graphics and images of bodies, reproductive systems, like diagrams of all of that kind of stuff, but with black bodies. And I just think that's absolutely brilliant because there needs to be more diverse sex education materials out there because we can't just all be showing the same images that just only relate to white people. If you are a sex educator and you're looking for some more diverse sex education materials to use in your classes, then I'll leave a link in the description to where you can get these ones. Okay, TV favorite time, TV. This is what a lot of you wanted me to talk about. And it is, of course, Bridgerton. However, by the time I got round to watching Bridgerton, enough people had already said their piece. And I'm sure a lot of you will have also seen the discourse around that sex scene in Bridgerton. So I won't go into a huge amount of detail here other than thoroughly enjoyed the show, complete escapism. However, lots of things to dissect and discuss and critique, which 
I just find really interesting. And I'm just gonna go ahead and recommend some other videos that you can watch of people like deep diving into some of these issues. Cause that's what Pleasure Trove is all about. I'm just like sending you out some recommendations. So if you want to see a really great discussion around the sexual assault scene in Bridgerton, and then also discussion about sex education in that time period, and going into conversations around consent, I would highly recommend checking out Ruby Rare's IGTV video. She did it as a live, but it's saved and you can just like pop it on in the background whilst you do some chores or go for a walk. She really goes in and it's great. And another video that I want to recommend talks about queer baiting, race baiting and colorism in Bridgerton and I'll link that in the description too. But what I'll say about the show is that one of the most interesting things for me is that when I've been speaking to friends and family who've also watched Bridgerton and I've said, oh, that sexual assault scene, a lot of people have been like, what sexual assault scene? And I think that really says it all of how limited our understanding is of consent. And if you're also thinking, wait, there's a sexual assault scene in Bridgerton? Like, did I miss something? I'm now just gonna briefly reference that scene. So if you don't wanna hear it, just like skip ahead a few seconds. But it's the scene where Daphne gets on top and takes control and makes Simon come inside her, even though he doesn't want to. Obviously it's a period drama and in the time in which it was set, marital rape is not even a thing. But by the UK's current laws and understanding of consent, that is sexual assault. Just in case you weren't clear on that. I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments. If you've watched Bridgerton, your thoughts on the consent, uh, sex ed, the queer baiting, race baiting. Like I think there's just like so much to discuss there and I'm really interested to see what they do with season two. Another thing that Dan and I recently watched on telly was the BBC documentary, Rod Gilbert's Stand Up to Infertility. Rod Gilbert is a Welsh comedian and him and his partner are trying to conceive and he's got some issues with his sperm. And so in this documentary, he takes a look at that, like why are men or people with penises excluded from a lot of the conversations around fertility? Why do men not like talking to each other about that? It was interesting to see just like how much is out there focused on people with the ovaries, like in terms of services, in terms of support groups, and then for the people with the sperm, not so much. And off the back of watching that documentary, Dan bought some loose boxes, so. <laughs> <laughs> Good news all round. But it's really interesting and I'd highly recommend watching it if you are on a fertility journey of any sort right now. And then my final TV favourite is It's a Sin, which is a five part drama on Channel 4 about the AIDS pandemic in the 1980s. It is heartbreaking, it is beautiful, it is joyous, it is devastating. There's also just been a lot of really interesting conversations online and different think pieces about the show, but all round, there's just been a huge amount of praise for it. It is brilliant. I'm sure lots of you have already watched it, but let's talk about it. Oh my God. Oh, if you haven't seen it yet, I would recommend pacing yourself. It is only five episodes, but it's very hard to binge. I honestly think it's one of the best pieces of TV I've ever seen. Like it's up there with like, I may destroy you and flea bag for me. It's just like, whew, it hits hard. Okay, we're gonna end on a joyous high because joy is important. And I'm gonna show you some stuff. But the first thing I wanna show you comes in a little silk thing. You know how I love my packaging. Is it a sex toy or is it like a sex aid? Like, I don't know, it's a sexy time product. And it's called the Onut. And I discovered this recently and I just had to get it. I was like, I need to try this. Like, what the fuck? I mean, you're probably looking at it right now just being like, what is that, Hada? What does it do? How does it work? That's what I thought at first as well. So this is the Onut. My husband got it me as a Christmas present. <laughs> so these things are separate. There's four of them. And the idea behind them is that you put them at the base of a penis and you can control the depth. So imagine this is a penis. So you put it on like that and then during penetration, it like does that. And then obviously there's four of them so it can help you like have even more control over the depth. You following, you following? Anyway, I think one of the things that we sometimes don't realize is that the cervix moves throughout your cycle. So there may be sometimes when you can handle 
some deep penetration. And then there might be some other times in your month when you're just like, ow, 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 no, 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 no. That's just hitting my cervix. And honestly, love this. What a great invention. And also it's a really beautiful colour. If you do get one of these, lube it up before you put it on. But yeah, look at that. I think I have a 7% off discount code for them and it's an affiliate link and I'll leave that in the description. Amazing. 10 out of 10. Love. The next thing I want to show you is so exciting to me. It was like a present to myself because it was very expensive. But it is this handmade vulva puppet. You may have seen some of these, because I know like some other sex educators have them, but they're handmade by this person in California, I think. So it's traveled a long way to get to me. If you do order one of these though, you have to pay a custom charge. I think I had to pay like an extra like 40 odd quid on top of the price of the vulva itself in order to receive it, but worth it. Look at this majestic beast. How am I gonna use this? I don't know, I'm showing it off in a video now and then I just have it for future use anytime I want to explain anatomy. So let's have a go now. This is the vulva. These are the outer lips or sometimes called labia majora. These are the inner lips, the labia minora. This is the clitoral hood. Peel it back. Do, do, do. There's the clitoris. This flower here is the urethra, and then the hole, whoop, <laughs> that's the vagina. One of the things that I did not realize that this had, which I absolutely love, is that on the inside of the vagina, I don't know if you can see that, here, this bit, so it adds like a little textured element because that is meant to be where the G-spot is. So, you know, if you do the come hither motion, in, that's where the G-spot is. And also you can kind of see like on this, model, obviously this is a very symmetrical person, but we're not all symmetrical. How like, if I'm doing that, if I'm like hitting the G spot, it's so high up that I'm, I can tell that I'm like also hitting the clitoris, like the internal clitoris. Absolutely love this. My little vulva puppet. And it also came with some exciting other things that I wasn't expecting. I've got like a vulva tea towel kind of thing. Well, I don't know. I don't know what to do with this. I feel like I should like hang it up somewhere. Oh, it's upside down. <laughs> this is why I want like my own separate office because Dan won't let me cover this room in like all of my like sex posters and sex artwork and stuff. That's why I need my own space. But that'll go up on a wall somewhere eventually. Also got some vulva puppet postcards and vulva puppet coasters. When we have dinner parties in the future post pandemic, I'll just be like, People can have a little educational moment whilst having their drink because it's got all like the labels on it as well. Love it. Leave suggestions in the comments for names for my beautiful silky smooth vulva puppet. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Pleasure Trove. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss more sex and relationships videos and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.